Okay, welcome back everyone. So let's get into chapter four. Any questions in any of the chapters? Any questions? No, you know everything? Just joking. Okay, that's good. Uh, let's get into chapter four. And now we'll get into a very important aspect. We all want to be like who? Like who? We all want to be like Jesus? Okay, so let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. Okay, chapter 4. Okay. The work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament before Jesus. Now, again, we must understand that before Jesus, it's still the Old Testament. Uh, but here in the Bible, it's been divided. So let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 15 and 17 in the life of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, 15 and 17. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from this mother womb. Talking about John the Baptist, the angel of the Lord is speaking to uh, Elizabeth and saying, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb itself. Now, when you look at the scriptures, all through the scriptures, John the Baptist is the first person who was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. Let me read that verse again. And he will go on before the Lord, the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a a people prepared for the Lord. Okay, uh, let's read verse, sorry, verse 15. Let me read that. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. From birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we must understand this. It's not like John the Baptist came. And the moment he was born, he started speaking in tongues, flowing the gifts of the Spirit. Obviously not. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, but over time, he began to grow and develop in the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? Remember this, Jesus, he learned the scriptures. It was, it was not like Jesus was, you know, even though he was a son of God, it was not like he knew everything. Right? He had to learn it. It was not like he, uh, you know, when he was 10 years old, automatically the whole book of Isaiah came into his, his spirit. No. He had to go. He had to learn. He had to read. He had to grow. He had to do everything that we are doing right now. So we see the work of the Holy Spirit in John the Baptist. Now, if you look at the life of John the Baptist, Jesus himself testifies and says, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. Wait a minute. If I was there at that moment, I would have said, Jesus, what are you talking? John the Baptist did not win one miracle. Did he do a miracle? Any miracle, John the Baptist? Did he heal the sick, cleanse the leper? Moses did bigger things. No. He parted the seas into two. Right? He did so many miracles. Elijah did miracles. Daniel did miracles. And he's saying, John the Baptist is greater than all of them. Why? Because he was born with the Holy Spirit in the power, walking under the power and anointing of Elijah. Then we see Mary in Luke one thirty five, same chapter, talking about the birth of Jesus. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high, highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the only, the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son yes. of God. Yes, yes. Okay. Now, Mary is there. Now, you, we must understand this. 
Mary is already engaged. She's going to get married to Joseph. Now imagine she's going and telling Joseph, Joseph, I'm already carrying. Now the angel of the Lord comes and says, Mary, you're going to, you're going to have a son. I say, how is this possible? I've not had any physical relationship with anybody. I'm a virgin. I don't, I don't, I haven't, I've not known a man. The angel replies and says, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and overshadow you. Again, the work of the Holy Spirit. Is this a miracle? Is it a miracle? Yes. The Holy Spirit, the word, the, the, Presence of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will do what He has to do. You, you, the Holy Spirit does not need, doesn't work according to what's happening around here. In the natural, we know it's physical consummation that brings forth a child. But for God, it doesn't matter. God is above the natural. The Holy Spirit says, uh, uh, the angel is saying, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you will bear a child. Let's read Elizabeth again, Luke 1, 41 through 45. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salu uh, salu salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in, in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she speak out with the with a loud voice and said, "Blessed art thou among women, and blessed in blessed is the fruit of the womb. And whence is the when is this womb to me, that that the mother of the Lord should come to me?" Yeah. So here we see again uh, that Elizabeth gets to know that. Mary is also pregnant and she goes there and she says, the Holy Spirit comes upon her and she begins to sing a song of praise, praising God. Then we look at Zechariah, Luke 167. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Talking about John the Baptist, John the Baptist's father, he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Same thing that what happened in the Old Testament, filled with the Holy Spirit, and they prophesied. Now let's go, let's look at the last point. Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Luke chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Luke chapter 3, 16 and 17. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with the water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, and strap of those sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the uh, with the Holy Spirit and fire, and the fork in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the gather the wheat into his barn. But the but the cliff he will burn with fire. Hmm. Now, again, we must understand what's happening here. John the Baptist is baptizing people in water. This is the baptism of repentance that means he's baptizing them saying repent of your sin now let me let me share this with you everyone open your bible go to the old testament go to the last page of the old testament you went there is there a blank page I hope you have a blank page. Is there a blank page? Mm. That blank page is 400 years. Now, in 400 years, what is happening? You know, there's all these offerings that were happening, the guilt offering, pain. You take a goat, you cut it, you take the blood, give it to the high priest, you know, sin offering, all those offerings. For 400 years, there was no prophetic word. God said, I have sent enough prophets, enough. I am not sending anyone to you. You do what you want, Israel. You do whatever you want to do. So 400 years, no prophetic word. They are doing the same thing again and again and again and again. What happens? It becomes a ritual. They have lost what it means. So here they are going, doing the offerings, 
going back living in sin. They're coming back doing the offering, going back and living in sin. So what's happening now? This is meaningless. These offerings, all those, you know, if you go back and read in the book of Exodus, when God established these offerings, they were done in so much of honor. Oh, this is God. We are doing these offerings for God. And because it's our lives that are at stake, all that is gone. It's become a routine. Now, the enemy, remember this, the enemy can use a routine to in your lives and in our lives to make things to to make us go into a passive mode right okay i'm doing it so it's okay I mean, we need to be careful 400 years there was no prophetic word they're doing everything that they want to do then out of nowhere comes this man john the baptist wearing strange clothes eating strange food right and what is he doing he's now, just picture this, right? I always say this. When you read your Bible, you've got to use your imagination. Think of it. Think of what you're reading. Imagine it. Picture it. The greatest nation is not Israel or uh, you know any other country. The greatest nation is your imagination. So you've got to think. Think of this. 400 years, they're doing something. Suddenly the Pharisees, Sadducees, all these priests have come to the temple. Nobody is there. Why nobody is there? Everyone has gone to the river Jordan. Who is there? John the Baptist. What is he doing? Baptizing people. Who is this John the Baptist? So the high priest and all of them also are coming and saying, Who is this strange man? He's eating all weird things. He's dressed up like a fool. And look at him how he looks. But hundreds of people are coming to him. What, was, what has changed? Remember that verse? He will be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. When you and I are anointed by the Holy Spirit, when we do something through the Holy Spirit, God will bring the people to follow you. You know, when you want to, you want to start a ministry or you want to start your own church or in anything that you're doing, God will bring people to you. You don't have to go running behind people. You don't have to go begging people for things. God will provide it for you. That's what the anointing will do. Here, this strange man, nobody has heard of John. He never went to any college. Nobody has heard of him. He's baptizing people in the river Jordan, and hundreds of people are coming to him. Why? Because that's what the anointing does. It says here that he baptized Jesus, sorry, John the Baptist is saying, I am baptizing in water, but after me comes one who will baptize you with spirit and in fire. What I am baptizing is just a repentance, but after me comes one whose sandals I'm not even worthy to remove. Talking about Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Matthew 3, 11. Same verse. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit. G John the Baptist is testifying about Jesus, saying, when Jesus comes, he'll baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus himself. Luke 3.22. Now, who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? Some of you are confused. <laughs> Son of God? Okay. Ma sorry? Man of God. Son of man? Okay. Give me, I'm searching for one word. Who is Jesus? Word of God. Word of God, okay. All high intellect. Savior, I'm searching for one word. 
the the Messiah. The Messiah. Thank you. Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. Okay. The Holy Spirit it, it, it descends on Jesus in Luke three twenty two. Go ahead, read it. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Yeah. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Oh gosh. Look at this. Do we see the Trinity here? Now think of this. Imagine what you would have done if you were there. You've got all these people standing there. You've got John the Baptist who's saying, no, I don't want to do this. Jesus says, no, it's good for you to do this this one time. And Jesus is going in the water. The Son of God, the Messiah, the man, the, the, the second person in the Trinity, God himself come down in flesh. He's standing there. He's getting water baptized in front of the people. And the heavens open. And a voice comes from heaven saying, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit comes in the form of a dove. Now, if the heavens open and says, This is my son, Paul, who I am well pleased, gone. I'll be very happy. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. Yes or no? Now, how many of you have got a vision or a dream and you remember it? You will remember it for the rest of your life. Any of you? Yeah, you get a dream or a vision, you will remember. Even when you're 90 years old, you're sleeping, I wake you up and say, Tell me the dream when you had when you're 20 years old. You will tell it. Why? Because you will remember it. It's it's there in your spirit. Now there are people there standing there, they are hearing this voice. They're seeing the dove come down like the like the Holy Spirit. Yet some of them turned back. And did not believe in Jesus. Can you think of that? They've never heard a voice like this. A voice coming from heaven. Yet, some of them didn't believe in him. But the Holy Spirit descended on him. Luke chapter 4 verse 1. Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit for his temptation episode. Let's read that. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan. That is after his baptism, and was led by the Spirit into the desert. What a what a important lesson that we can learn here. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert. It's not like Jesus finished the baptism and said, "Okay, come, let's have party." All right, now baptize. Let's have a you know celebration. No, the Holy Spirit said, "Get ready." You have to go. 40 days, no food, no water. You have to go into the desert. Now, if you've gone to, if you, you know, if you stayed in a desert, it's not easy. First of all, without food, how many of you have tried fasting for 40 days? Yeah. How many of you ate on the second day? Yes or no? When I became a believer, I said, I'm going to do 40 days of fasting. By the next day, I was having breakfast. We will skip. We will do from next month. That went on for one year. Because fasting is not easy. Now Jesus is here. He is just a man. 40 days, no food, no water, nothing. And on top of that, temptations directly from the devil. Now we have different temptations, right? Phone, you know, then TV. Here directly the devil has come. See, you are the Messiah, no? You take this stone, turn it into bread. Make sense? You take the stone, turn it into bread, eat little, turn it back into stone if you want later. Why didn't Jesus do that? Why didn't he obey? Or why didn't he fall into that temptation? Because he was led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told him, tell this devil, man shall not live by bread alone but by the, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If Jesus was walking in his own strength, we don't know what would have happened. No cross, nothing. We'll be still cutting bulls and goats. But we thank God that he overcame that temptation. Think of this, the second one. What was the second one? 
you the devil said if you are the son of god the devil Jumped led him to a high the... place and showed him in an instant the kingdom of the world and he said i'll give you all the authority and splendor for it so if you worship bow down and worship me you bow down and worship me i'll give you everything what did jesus say there's no way it is written it is written again the holy spirit led him for that right lord answered it is written worship the lord your god and serve him only then the led, devil led him to jerusalem adam stand on the highest temple and said if you are the son of god throw yourself down now the devil is quoting scripture devil is talking psalms 91 how many of us say psalms 91 how many of you know it by heart by heart psalms 91 you know you should know scriptures by heart devil himself knows psalms 91 he's saying you throw yourself down because your word the the scriptures say that he will set his angels in charge of you what is the devil doing he's trying to manipulate the son of god himself the one who's the word he's trying to mix you know bring in uh, bring in uh, this word in the wrong context what did jesus do he took that text he put it into context and he said, but it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. Now, so important for us. It's so important for us when we read the word of God to be led by the spirit of God. Jesus gave all his, you know, uh, rebuttals through the word of God. He defended every temptation through the word of God. Jesus walked in power and of the spirit. Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. Look at the response from here. Now he, you know, verse 13 says, when the devil had finished all the tempting, he left him for an opportune time. That means the devil came back with temptations. It was not like, oh, three temptations over. So now, uh, you know, no problem. No, the devil came back, came back at him, came back at him all of those 40 days. And then he overcame all those temptations. Now read verse 14. What Jesus happened? returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. The moment he comes, there's a devil. You know, a few verses later on, Jesus drives out that evil spirit. The evil spirits come to him and says, Why have you come at such a time? Why have you come like this? Why have you come to destroy me before my time how did how is this possible i mean the devils are you know demons are afraid of him because of the anointing in the of the holy spirit you know even now as believers you and i are empowered by the holy spirit right i can give you examples of especially when i traveled north india for many many years there were many times people who were you know possessed and demon possessed they would come and many a times it has worked many a times it has not worked but one thing is standard one thing remains true greater is the holy spirit that is in us than he that is in the world one thing stands true that the cross has defeated the work of the enemy that doesn't change right so many times you know we just you know when i've gone ministering there was this one time there was this young boy maybe about 17 18 years old we were doing a conference in um, jamshedpur and uh, this young boy right he was leading the worship time maybe 17 18 years old and uh, after the it was during the last day of the conference and we were all just, you know, just standing and praying. This young boy, you know, he began to manifest. I have never got so scared in my life. Now, I went there to teach. Now, I'm not a professional in uh, chasing demons away. Okay, I went to teach. I didn't know. I didn't sign up for all this. 
So this guy started speaking in a gruff voice, and I've seen many of it, but he came straight to my face and he said, his voice was like, you know, like as deep as a lion's voice. So 17 year old boy said, what happened to you? You were singing, no? But he was so, and see what, what happened was that day uh, for my return ticket, I had canceled the train ticket. And I booked a, a you know plane ticket to get back here. Nobody knew that, okay, because I did it just the previous day or so. So he came up to me and he said, "You know, the plane that you're going in tomorrow, I will make sure it it doesn't land." I was taken back. I said, "Nobody knows this, right?" And I got really scared. Then I said, "What is your name?" That scared me even more. I shouldn't have asked him. He said, "My name is Lucifer." I said, the biggest fellow has come off. I got so scared. I said, okay, you you know, small demons, you can do something. Suddenly Lucifer comes, what will I do? So I got very scared. Then I remember the word of God. The Holy Spirit inside me said, the devil is a liar, number one. Two is whoever it is, the, Holy, the, the, the cross has defeated the enemy. Now inside I'm very afraid. Outside, I showed I'm not afraid. That's how you should be. Inside, I was waiting to come back home and sleep. I was so scared. But outside, I was like, hey, you can't do anything. The more closer he's coming, the more I'm getting scared. Now, I'm a believer. I had Bible and all with me that time. So I went, I held the Bible like this. Now, the more I'm holding the Bible, the more aggressive is he. I kept the Bible back. I was just a new believer, right? Just maybe one year. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he began to minister. He said, Paul, this is what I want you to just, just use your authority. I said, God, I'm fearful. I'm getting scared inside. See, the Holy Spirit knows what's inside. The devil doesn't know. The Holy Spirit knows. He said, Holy Spirit, I'm scared. All of a sudden, that fear just went. Just simple prayer, huh? no, no praying in tongues. You know, singing uh, hallelujah 10 times, nothing. He said a simple prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command the spirit, this evil spirit to get out of this person. At that moment, he, the spirit left him. And then I realized that if not for the Holy Spirit, I would have made a fool of myself there, trying to do things on my own strength. Jesus here, was walked in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that demons came and fell at his feet. That is the anointing that God wants us to walk in. We can get there. Yes or no? Or is it only because Jesus, the Son of God, did it happen like that? No. It's the same Holy Spirit. Jesus ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Although Jesus was God, he did not do his miracles. He did by his own powers, rather, he did the miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I was Jesus, and the devil came to me and tried to tempt me, I would have said, first you tell me, you know who I am? Do you know who I am? I would have said that, for sure. For sure, I would have said that. Do you know who I am? I'm the one who made you fall from heaven. I am the one who created you. You're trying to bring temptation on me. He didn't do all of that. All he did was, this is what the word says. I'll go by that. Simple. Simple example set for us. Right? Simple example. Just be humble, yet walk in power. Walk in authority. Yet walk in humility. That's a beautiful combination that we can have. Jesus worked the supernatural by the power of the Holy Spirit. Three facts to confirm this. He emptied himself. Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 says, He made himself of no reputation. Meaning he emptied himself. When Jesus came into this world, it was not like Jesus was in Jerusalem one day and the same Jesus is in uh, Judea and another day in Bethlehem. No, he was, he left his power. 
right? So one day if he's in Jerusalem, it'll take him two days to come to Judea. He traveled. It was not like Jesus said, I will eat whatever I want to eat. I will make the food on my own and eat. He didn't say, okay, today I want something, one snap, and then the food comes and eat. No. The Bible says he worked. He, was a, he, he worked as a carpenter. He worked. He did physical labor. He drank water. He ate food. He slept. As God, he did everything that you and I are doing right now. He emptied himself. He, in human body, he was not omnipotent, omnipresent, or omniscient. In human body, he was not omnipotent. There were times he was tired, he had to rest, he was chained, he was whipped, he was nailed on the cross. He was not omnipresent. He had to travel by boat, he had to travel by ship, by donkey, by walk. He had to do that. He was not omniscient. That means he didn't know everything. He had to grow. So if you look at scriptures, John uh, in Luke, he grew in wisdom. Let's read that. Luke 8, 28. Luke 8, 28. Oh, sorry. Luke 2, 46 also we can read. Oh, uh, let me so, read Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Okay, And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He grew in the things of God. It was not, as I said, when Jesus was born, and as he grew up as a little boy, it was not like he knew everything. He had to sit and learn. Only thing, he didn't go to Bible college. But he, he, he learned on his own. He read, he learned. Right? He grew in what he was doing. John 17, 5, while on the earth, Jesus did not have the glory which he had when he was with his father. He laid aside that glory and he walked in sonship glory. So John 15, 17, 5 talks beautifully about it. John chapter 17. And verse 5. This is a beautiful prayer that Jesus made. What and, an astounding prayer. And now... Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Mm. Now, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the foundations of the world. So that means what? Jesus, the glory of Jesus when he walked on this, on this earth was called the sonship glory. And every believer can walk in this sonship glory. Amen? Do we believe it? Yes or no? Okay, put your hand on your heart. And say this. I will walk in the sonship glory that God has for me through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what He wants us to do. Right? He wants us. Through this sonship glory, God revealed himself through miracles. God revealed himself through grace and truth. If you want to know what Jesus was like before, go to Revelations chapter 1. And we will not look at it now, but it, it, it gives you a picture of that glorified Jesus. That glorified man who is a mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Right? So. What Jesus said about his ministry, the miracles that Jesus did, was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. He never said, I'll do it on my own power. He never said, I will do it on my own strength. He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit, everywhere he speaks to the disciples, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Right? I will send you the comforter. Everywhere that, where the disciples are crying, they're saying, no, Jesus, don't go. He said, I have to go because only then, the Holy Spirit will come and he will do his work. So as believers, we will do the works what Jesus did. Because when Jesus was here, he worked under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus went to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit as a comforter. If you look at John chapter 16, verse 8 onwards, I'll just read that. Right? When he comes, he will convict the world of of guilt in regard to sin 
and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness because i'm going to the father where you can see me no longer and in regard to judgment because the prince of the world now stands condemned right then he goes on in that same verse he's encouraging the disciples he says i tell you the truth you will weep and moan while the world rejoices you will grieve but your grief will turn to joy right so he goes on you know talking about how the holy spirit will play a very important role in the life of these disciples have you ever thought of this peter the disciple what did he do he denied jesus he wasn't even there at the cross when jesus was dying on the cross none of the disciples other than john was there he was fearful he said i don't know jesus Three and a half years of hard work gone down the drain in one sentence. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Gone. Three and a half years. He has walked with Jesus. The only person who walked on water apart from Jesus, Peter. The same Peter who said, I am ready to die with you, Jesus. Now, when he saw reality, he said, I don't know who's Jesus. I don't know. He denied the Jesus. He was afraid. Now, Nothing against Peter. But what do we see after that? The same Peter, after the Holy Spirit came upon him in Acts chapter 2, what happened? Same Peter. Was there a change? Here he was saying, I don't know who's Jesus. He was hiding. He was afraid. He was fearful. And here the Holy Spirit has filled him. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he's saying, he's standing in front of everyone in Jerusalem, the same place, the same city where he denied Jesus. He's standing and he's saying, Okay, what you're seeing now, these people are not drunk. This is the promise spoken of in Joel chapter 2, and he gives this whole sermon, unafraid of what the Pharisees or the leaders of the, of the, of the temple would say. What happened? Something changed. Here he was afraid. One month later, standing and saying, Hey, this is Jesus, whom you crucified, whom you killed. Now he's alive. He has resurrected from the dead. Why? Because the Holy Spirit changed everything in his life. No more was he afraid. No more was he fearful. There was a change, complete change. And the Holy Spirit began to work in many people's lives, the disciples. How many of you have read about how the disciples have died? They've been martyred. You should read about it. It's so disheartening. But they went to the, to the place of death rejoicing. They're singing songs. It was like, hey, you kill me now. I'm going to be with Jesus. Anyways, I was with him here. Now I'll go see a glorified Jesus. So death is nothing. Made no sense to them. It, it was nothing. It was not a fearful thing for them. Andrew was cut into two. Can you think of that? Andrew, the disciple, he was cut into two. Some of them was were uh, you know was stabbed to death. A spear went into them. Unafraid. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit. You think Jesus on the cross was he afraid? Was he afraid of the cross? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's, he's praying and he's saying, Lord, if there's any other way, give me that way, but let not my will, but let your will be done. Was he afraid of the cross? Yes or no? What do you think? Was he afraid? Oh, they're going to crucify me. The nails will go in here. You know, pin only is so painful. I'm, I'm a carpenter. I know how it will pain. Did he? Was it the cross? Was it the physical pain that he was worried of? No. It was that separation from God. How can I separate myself from God? We've all been one. Now, because of sin, there was a separation. Have you noticed that everywhere Jesus said, My Father, my Father. But on the cross, what does he say? My God. That's the only place he says, My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? There was separation. Jesus knew 
that we need the Holy Spirit in our ministry. And look at Jesus. He teaches people in his ministry. He's speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He also says, if you blaspheme, meaning uh, make fun of the Holy Spirit or ridicule or mock the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness for you. When, when does that happen? Remember Jesus, uh, you know, he is a person who's possessed by an evil spirit. And Jesus drives out that demon. And the people say, he's driving out demon through the help of demons. He's driving out Beelzebub with the, with the, with the help of Beelzebub. And Jesus goes on to say, hey, listen, you can say anything about me or anything that is happening in the, uh, over here, but don't go against the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? So he's teaching them about the Holy Spirit. He teaches them that everything that he is doing is not by his own ability, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, everywhere, right? He teaches. The Father gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So we got a couple of those verses there. We won't go into all of those verses. Uh, but you can go ahead and read those verses, right? Where Jesus is saying, the Father, when you ask, the Father will give you the Holy Spirit. Everywhere he says, I will send the Comforter. I will send him. When he comes, he will do this. He will do this and that. He, he goes on teaching the, his disciples. And then we look at the work of the Holy Spirit in Christ's death and resurrection. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Let's read that. So beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on the on in the world, and taken up in glory. Yes, that was the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus died... They took his physical body. So how did Jesus die? He died of an extreme cardiac arrest. Right? His heart was, you know. The psalmist says that you know, I look down and I can see my bones. What we see in Passion of the Christ is nothing compared to what he was. You know, let me say this to you. If Jesus wore a t-shirt at that time, you, you could have carried him like this i'm telling you you would have carried him just like you know like like you carry this book you would have carried him like that because he was nothing he was every all the blood and water has gone out of his body it was nothing he he died of extreme cardiac every time he took a breath there was exertion on his lungs exertion on his heart and the more he took a breath, the more he could not breathe after that. Extreme, painful death that Jesus went through. When they put, when they put him in that tomb, the, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Paul writes and he says, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will raise our bodies. Now Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, he was not limping. They... Actually, they hit me you know, too many times on my left leg, so it's paining. No, there were no marks on him. There was no, I mean, not no marks, but there was no pain in his body. In a glorified body, there's no pain. And the work of the Holy Spirit was to raise him up from the dead. I love that verse where the angel says, Why do you look for the living among the dead? That verse just captivates me. Don't, why are you looking for the dead among the living? He's living. He's, he's alive. He's gone ahead. That's what the Holy Spirit did. He, he reno, regenerated Jesus' body. And he will do the same for us. He will, in a twinkling of an eye, we will get a glorified body. And that we'll learn more on the rapture and all of that later. But that's amazing. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And even right now, we may have sickness in our body, diseases. The work of the Holy Spirit is to bring healing, to bring restoration. He can do it, right? So after his resurrection, 
before his ascension, John chapter 20 and verse 22. Let's read that last verse. John chapter 20 and verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, this is when the disciples are all afraid. They are sitting in the room and praying. They're afraid, oh, Jesus is dead, he's gone. But there's some news moving around that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. So Jesus comes, John 20, he meets his disciples and he blows on them the Holy Spirit. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. That was the moment when they became, you know, when the Holy Spirit came into them and began to reside in them. But in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 1, he says, go and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus blew on them, they received the born again experience. But Jesus knew that they need the baptism of the Holy Spirit if they have to do the work of the ministry. So go and wait. I will send that Holy Spirit. I'll send the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that's what happens in Acts chapter 2. Right? So we see here wonderfully. First, we saw on the, the role of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is. Then we saw the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. We saw a little bit of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus and among the disciples as well. right? And so next class, we'll get into the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, that is, in the early church. Right. Any questions? Any thoughts? Everyone able to... Track along. Everyone able to understand? You're, you're understanding what we're doing here, right? So just go back if you have time. Read a couple of these scriptures. Try to understand. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Then um, we'll come back next Friday and continue from where we stop. Okay, let's just say a word of prayer. Yes. Um, does it mean when jesus blew the holy spirit in them that is when they became born again yes when yes okay. okay thank you yes. thank you yes that's the born again experience um that's what second corinthians 5 17 that's what happened to them meaning the way the moment the holy spirit came and they had that born again experience uh, and so, but they needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be able to do the work of the ministry. So, thank you, sir. Right, yes. Pastor, okay, let's pray and let's close. Yes, I have a question. Um, uh, it's written here at the age of 30, he started the public ministry and uh, he was recognized as Messiah through bap baptism. Uh, he's the Messiah, John Baptist identifies okay. him. Before that, with, he grew in wisdom, yeah. but he was 25, 26, 27. So that point of time, like he was with the Holy Spirit? Oh, sorry, yes, Holy Spirit at all Spirit. times, at all times. So the thing is, there is no account of his life as a youth. There are two accounts, one when he was, I think, eight, and then one when he was 12 years old. And after that, it was only when he was 30, when he starts his earthly ministry. But over all this time, of course, he would have studied, he would have gone back. You see, when uh, when he launched his ministry, he opened the book of Isaiah, and he, the Bible says he found, he went to that place, and he found the place, right? So it was his learning, everything happened there in Jerusalem. Everything he learned on his own. Right? He studied, he learned. And as he was doing it, the Holy Spirit was there. It's just that we don't have an account of what he did. Anything else? Okay, I think we've passed our time. Well, let's just quickly say a word of prayer and we'll close. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for teaching us. We thank you for the wonderful Holy Spirit that ministers to us, O oh God. And I pray that even as we just continue to learn, O oh God, there's so much to learn. But Lord, we put our trust in you. We put our faith in you, Lord. Teach us, lead us, and guide us, O oh God. We commit each one of us into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you next week.